Welcome back to Westeros Org's discussions of uh, House of a Dragon. This is our third episode about the second season, uh, and it'll be a really fun one because it kind of introduces a couple of background houses that, uh, secondary houses, I guess I'd say, that, that are have a long history of one another. <laughs> you could say that. We'll start with the episode summary. The episode features an adjusted opening sequence. Uh, we have the image of Prince Jaehaerys being added. He's on his funeral bier, and the, we also see the hanged rat catcher. So they've expanded the tapestry. Uh, the episode then properly opens with the ancient Black and Blackwood feud, when they are um, it's reigniting over boundary disputes and escalates quickly into violence uh, over their dueling loyalties to the different claimants to the Iron Throne. This ultimately leads to the Battle of the Burning Mill, where hundreds perish, including the impetuous young uh, Sir Aaron Bracken, his own sword shoved through his throat. Then we go to Dragonstone as we see tensions flaring as Jace laments, burying Auric besides Eric. But Rhaenyra defends a decision saying, you know, he, he kept his oath, so you can't won't blame him. Uh, Rhaenys ends up doubting that Otto was involved in the assassination, and she predicts uh, it's chaos from Kristen Cole and Aegon managing affairs, urging Rhaenyra to consider Alicent's peace offering, but Rhaenyra hasn't read it even. She couldn't bear to. Back in King's Landing, Aegon's new Kingsguard, his uh, entourage of young knights from the previous episodes, uh, are rather lacking in seriousness. Yeah. Um, whereas Sir Christian Cole, burdened by his new role as the Hand, is attending uh, a small council meeting where the topic of uh, the day is the Brackens attacking the Blackwoods. The small council discusses how ineffective the aged and infirm Lord Tully will be, and Cole plans to rally the Crownland houses and march uh, to the Riverlands with his forces augmented by theirs. And then we're back to Dragonstone as Missaria and Rhaenyra discuss Missaria's role at court, and but she wants revenge against the High Towers. Really, um, Rhaenyra sends her sons to the Vale, and she tells Rhaena, you know, you're going to escort them and continue on to Pentos. Uh, tells her to mail Prince Reg uh, Reggio and everything. Uh, Rhaena doesn't really like this, but she she's dutiful. Um, um, yeah, well. And then we move back to the Riverlands where uh, Damon arrives at the Harrenhal in the middle of a rainstorm and he finds its cavernous ruins nearly deserted until he finally comes across Sir Simon Strong and his kin and a small household. Uh, and Sir Simon pledges fealty to Rhaenyra with uh, alacrity and Damon insists on being addressed as Your Grace and demands the castle's repair, noting the Riverlands' divided loyalties due to the Bracken-Blackwood conflict and uh, Lord Tully's infirmity. Uh, he clearly seems to plan to kind of get things sorted out using that as a wedge. Yeah. Uh, we see, obviously, Christian Cole's about to march with his army, and Alicent stops him and says, oh, here's my brother, Gwen Hightower. Arrived just in time. And Gwen intends Hugo. to... Yeah, <laughs> that's right. If you may, may recognize Freddy Fox from The Great, where he played the, the king, of the, the, the fictional king of Sweden, Hugo. There was never a King Hugo of Sweden, I believe. So. Uh, no, a, but it's very fun. <laughs> very fun character. I think it was the first and the third seasons. Uh, but anyways, uh, it was... I, I recognize that guy. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, Gwen is a very kind of... Smarmy, charming, kind of clearly thinks he's better than Cole because yeah. of his birth. Um, and Cole tries to dissuade him from joining him on, on the march, but um, Hightower insists. And then before leaving, Sir Kristen approaches Allison asking for a favor, which he kind of grants, so kind of, you know, in front of everybody, kind of <laughs> makes her hesitate, I think. And we see that her brother is watching as well. Yep. Um, then we go to Dragonstone, where uh, Rhaenys reports that no enemies have been sighted during her patrols, but um, Alfred <coughs> Broom urges that they should be offensive, uh, given that there certainly will be some repercussions for the killing of uh, Jaehaerys. And uh, Rhaenyra resists using the dragons in battle, and her council suggests that she should go into hiding. Uh, this offends her quite a bit, and she calls it treason, which is perhaps a little strong for... <laughs> yeah, I find that a little <clears throat> over top. We're back on Driftmark to see Rhaenys and Corlys at the, the shipyards. 
and we're kind of discussing what challenges Rhaenyra is facing with the, the war and the council, mm -hmm. and also the problem of the succession for the you know, Lord of the Tides. Joffrey doesn't know anything about ships, and Corlys seems, yeah, but says, well, how about Reyna? He says, well, she doesn't know anything about ships either, but... Mm -hmm. He, and he basically says, well, we can put this off at another time. It's something that we don't need to worry about right now. Right. Uh, and then we see Reyna and uh, the young children departing with their dragons. Uh, they have two dragons with them, Tyraxes and, and Stormcloud. Yeah. They're both uh, very, very young. Yeah. And then she's also given four dragon eggs. Uh, and uh, Baila suggests to Reyna, who is still none too happy about the assignment, that this could be an opportunity for her, seeing that she has no dragon of her own, that perhaps one of the four eggs will hatch right, for her. Right, yeah. Uh, the colors are interesting, like uh, there was a red, there was a blue, I think like a yellow and a green. Um, kind of curious to see where they go with that. Mm. Then we're in King's Landing. It's kind of a brief scene where Alice said, mm visits Helena, who's kind of, oh, children die, it happens, and, mm. and she also forgives her quite suddenly, and, and doesn't really explain what she's forgiving her for. No. Presumably, barging, or the fact that she saw Alicent with Cole, but we, d we don't know. And Cole not be being on his oh, duties, on his duty, that maybe yeah. a little change yeah. or something. Something like that. Um, also in King's Landing, we see Aegon uh, putting on Aegon the Conqueror's Valyrian steel armor uh, with the intention of flying into battle. But this is cleverly dissuaded by, by Lars, who gives him two versions of rumors. One that he is bravely flying out, and the other is that the council has urged him to fly out so they can rule in his absence. Yeah. Um, and he promptly then uh, appoints Loris as his master of whisperers. So Loris is definitely playing his hand very well. And then the King's Garden, the new King's Garden Knights uh, say that, well, since you're not flying out, let's uh, go down to a brothel to watch uh, Rain Squire lose his virginity. Uh, and they're clearly intending to partake themselves, uh, only for Aegon to remind them, actually, quite seriously, that they have now sworn oaths of celibacy. We then change scene to the tavern in King's Landing that has, I think, been featured before. <laughs> and we once again see Ulf, um, who this time gets a name. He was a fellow who was commenting on the, uh, wondering, you know, what happened with the rat catchers. <laughs> And he's presented as a sort of wastrel, a gossip, who's like everyone's friend. If you can who, get a drink out of it. If he, yeah, <laughs> everyone's friend and everyone kind of, if you give him a drink, he'll have got stories to tell yeah. you. And, uh, he ends up being introduced to his Dornishman and starts talking about, oh, yeah, the con country my ancestor never conquered. Or they say even they wept when Jaehaerys, my, you know, the, my grandfather died. Oh, your grandfather. They call him a conciliator. Yeah. All, all hush, hush. <laughs> and he claims to, in fact, be yeah, the bastard son of Prince Balin Targaryen, ha making him half-brother to both Daemon and Viserys. And uh, he also indicates he's loyal to his niece, Rhaenyra. But then in comes Aegon and his King's Guard. The latter wearing kind of quite normal attire, their usual clothing rather than and the King's Guard uniform. So they're kind of trying to hide who they are. And all gets quite tongue tied. And he leads the call to hail King Aegon, who doesn't pay any attention to him at all. And then they drag a squire to find the brothel madam, which leads to an encounter, an unexpected encounter with. Aemon, who is in her arms That's once again. Aegon laughs at him, he mocks him about how loyal he is to his prostitute. And Aemon curtly responds that, you know, one whore is much like another before um, coldly and nakedly <laughs> leaving her to the squire. Uh, he's quite seething, however, we can see that he, at how he's being treated. I know that there will be a lot of people rewinding that part of him coldly and nakedly. <laughs> I have to say, uh, but uh, very, you know, very, very brave of Mitchell. Was, uh, all the actors are willing to get their clothing off, and he, he, there's a, he actually manages to seem dignified. Yeah, no, it's true. He uh, marches off uh, in, uh, yeah, with not a stitch on, and uh, over there is his, his, his uh, eye patch. Uh, that's true, but the eye patch is in the usual place. <laughs> uh, um. 
<laughs> right. Uh, let's go on. And then we see, uh, we catch up with Cole again. And Cole and Gwyn Hightower, they are, uh, um, well, they're supposed to be encamped, but Cole has caught up with Gwyn, who is instead on route to an inn, because he's not planning to camp out in the middle of bloody nowhere, uh, when they are ambushed by Bela on Moondancer. And... Uh, she then reports back and urges, urges Rhaenyra to field a, a dragon against Cole now that she's seen that he has his uh, army uh, marching around in, in the Riverlands. Uh, Very exciting sequence as well. I mean, the dragons are really, this is a next level where we yeah, powers. the dragon trainers are fantastic, I have <laughs> yeah. to say. Then back at Hall, we're seeing Damon experiencing rather unsettling dreams in, in the Leaky Castle, <laughs> encountering in eerie visions of the young Millie Alcock. Rhaenyra, and also the infant Jaehaerys. Uh, that was a big surprise, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, Millie was insisting up and down, I'm not in it again, my, my story's done. Uh, I was very surprised, yeah. I had no idea. That I think you said coming. no flashbacks, and no. It's not a flashback, it's no. It's not a flashback, it's uh, uh, Damon having some distinctly odd experience in Harrenhal. The, uh, the leakiness is must be, must be mold or something. I think. Well, house. I think <laughs> also when when he comes to, it's kind of like he's either walked in his sleep or he's yeah. been lost in this sort of waking dream because yeah. he wakes up in the godswood of mm -hmm. Heron Hall and the uh, the mysterious dark haired servant woman tells him he's going to die there. Yeah. Um, the episode then comes to an end with uh, Rhaenyra seeking Missaria's help to meet with Alice in, in secret. So disguised as a Septa and escorted by Sir Stephen Darklin, uh, disguised as a Septon, she meets Alison in the Septon King's Landing, uh, pleading uh, for peace and discussing Viserys' last wishes. Uh, Alison insists that she's not lying about Viserys changing his mind, and Rhaenyra finally asks her to recount what she heard exactly. And Alison says that he named Aegon and called him the prince that was promised mm. to unite the realm. And, that sparks Rhaenyra's memory, and she insists to Alicent that she has misunderstood. Viserys was talking about an old tale concerning Aegon the Conqueror. The Conqueror, she repeats. But Alicent, even though she's now uncertain about what Viserys intended, insists that there can be no stopping things now. Kristen Cole is on the march, and you know things have been put into motion, and it is too late to do anything. Changes this episode just a bit. Uh... The Riverlands situation is kind of, you know, the Blackwoods are the ones that started a conflict in the book. The Blackwoods would never start a conflict. <laughs> no, they never would. <laughs> no, no, no. So having it be seen as the Brackens launching this first real attack is is in itself a change. Yes. Um, it's, you know, what happens is they start raiding and attacking. Um, in fact, uh, I, we have the quote here. Uh, in the Riverlands, raiders out of Raven Tree, flying Rhaenyra's banners, crossed into the lands of House Bracken, burning crops, driving off sheep and cattle, sacking villages, and despoiling every sept they came on. Noting that you know, the Blackwoods were one of the last houses south of the Neck who still follow the old gods. So it, it's. And this is after Damon has already arrived, the banners have already called. Mm. Uh, the, people have already the, picked sides, and the Blackwoods lead this first attack. They've changed the order of things here by having him arrive after, but this has kind of launched on its own. Um, yeah, so they are literally doing it in Rhaenyra's name. Right. Um, and so presumably we don't see Sir Aaron kill this Blackwood, but we assume that he ended up doing so when it goaded to. And that leads a reprisal where the Blackwoods attack and then the Brackens lead. The Burning Mill is the Sir Amos Bracken, who's like the heir, I think, to uh, Stonehenge. He leads it, forces down, but they get ambushed mm. by the Blackwoods and get defeated. Um, so they, they reconfigured it a bit. They made it so the Blackwoods don't, I mean, are acting differently, uh, which is which I think is a bit interesting. And I think, I, I guess I'll bring up uh, The whole old gods. Thing. I mean, they only mention it very much at all. But the Blackwoods are following the old gods. Um, no, uh, it's it's true. But it, as, as true. part of a conflict okay, between them, conflict. is I think yes, is, is, yes. Is, is 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 part uh, of the because uh, obviously there is some discussion on several accounts of the fact that they have been feuding for a long while, um, and yes, no, nobody brings in the religious aspect. 
um, and it, it, this is just part of the reconfiguring yes. of sort of the timeline in the Riverlands. I, I, I a, it is left... The Riverlands seems like much more undecided. It's yes. only now starting to, to break out and people haven't really said what's going on. Um, you know, in the book, The Battle of the Burning Mill... Uh, uh, Raylan Rivers is a, a bastard half half brother of Lord uh, of Amos or of, of Lord Bracken, ends up leading the survivors back to Stonehenge to find that it's been captured already by Damon and like the Dories and the Roots and the Blackwoods, and it, it sort of they bend the knee and oh the phrase as well the phrase are actually right off the bat because mm. of a uh, fool Frey who I'm not sure will be here this season. Uh, Sir Forrest Frey, who was one of Rhaenyra's suitors. Um, so they, there's been a, they, they really have changed uh, the timing of things a I bit. Mean, my suspicion is that, because if you look at the narrative in the book, Damon doesn't really have that much to do. I mean, he arrives, people start rattling, mm. and there's not much. Yeah, he does. He just. And then he sits at Hiron Hall for a while. Well, he takes Stonehenge, but then yes, a lot of it is like is. sitting there and kind of overseeing, I guess, the gathering of forces, but he's not. So, uh, this is an indication they're, they're complicating matters a little bit to perhaps give him something more to do. Um, now, we also have um, a change in character, I think, yeah. with, with Rainus. Uh, Rhaenys is portrayed as quite resistant to fighting here. She's urging Rhaenyra to uh, try and find a peaceful solution. Uh, but in Fire and Blood, she's quite fearless and bold and ready to go to war rather than being a voice for calm or peace. Uh, um, there is a little bit of a trend of them giving this to the women. In yeah, the thing. women in general are peace talkers and it's men who are the ones who are the only ones who want to I mean, fight and the way Alison phrases it that is basically now in sort of in the hands of you know Cole the, and Eamon and, and yeah and Damon and, and but yeah but men are making the decisions and we can't yeah. stop them uh you know thematically I understand the point it, it is feel it does feel heavy-handed when like there's you know okay you'll say oh Rhaenyra wants Eamon and then she forgets about wanting Eamon when Jaehaerys is dead and so they they kind of have these things where it's almost like, oh, you just tried doing something by calling for Eamon's head and that's blown up in your face and now you're back to, well, gosh, we really should find some peace. Yeah. Um, and also, it would be nice to not perhaps be so stereotypical on it because I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty be... sure Rhaenys, I, I feel like, why yeah. does Rhaenys have to be the one who's constantly like... Yeah. I mean, there, this is old because she's older and wiser, but like, She's she's fierce. She's bold. Why yeah. why would she not welcome the chance to you know elevate I mean, her fam her part of the family? Yeah, try, try telling Visenya that women are aren't fierce. Yeah, I, I think she'd uh, skewer you, <laughs> on dark sister. Never change. It's not really a change because they already called him Otto's nephew. But now we're talking to Aegon how it's Uncle Orman, and so again Orman Hightower is a nephew of. Uh, of Otto Hightower. He's a cousin of Allison. But because he's her cousin, I guess, and of her generation, mm. I guess he's being called uncle. For shorthand. For shorthand, although I believe then someone on a small council also refers to him as your uncle, which is, I think it's... I yeah. guess they're using the same I mean, form. We have the same in, in the tavern with uh, the Ulf's supposed relation to uh, uh, to Aegon, for example. Well, he calls him his and, nephew as well. Yes, he calls well, he, him well, and, and calls Jocera's nephews. I mean, that's the step too close. If Rhaenyra... Well, he doesn't call Viserys nephew. He calls Rhaenyra is, nephew. Uh, and he calls Rhaenyra niece. Niece, and yeah, he calls... And then he calls, sorry, uh, Jocera's, I think, is, is brought up as well. As a nephew. As, as somebody who doesn't have Valyrian hair, but is Valyrian, and refers to him as a nephew. Yeah, well, there, there he is, but a great nephew instead of a nephew. Yes, but I'm saying that they they compress them, they simplify uh, relations a little bit, and and. Uh... Um, then there's a statement that the largest undeclared host is the the Riverlands at this time. Um, I mean, we have we have we have kind of two 
parts of this. Like yes, the Riverlands, like the Tyrol, the, the river, the, the the Reach is kind of a, a mess at this point because mm-hmm. the the Tyrols kind of decide after all this violence and bloodshed that you know we're gonna sit this one out. So there's no if some of our vassals take part, but this is not a great mobilization of the Reach. Yeah. Obviously, we saw that Alicent was cognizant of that. She wanted Otto to go to the Tyrells. Yeah. And, and that raised the question somebody asked, are we going to see Highgarden? Um, I, I've heard nothing. They've, mm. that I don't know if they've cast, I don't really follow casting stuff that closely. I don't know if they've cast Tyrells. Um, it, it would be weird for Otto to disappear for the rest of the season. Yeah. Um, and, but we know now, Daeron isn't cast. I don't think Ormond is cast. So if we see it with anybody, it'll be like extras. Because mm. he and, doesn't say at the point what, what he's going to do, whether he's going to go to the Tyrells or if he's going to go to... Uh, well, he has to pass by anyways. Uh, to get that to... said, yes, it's true. So, so I think he, he will. So I, I assume we'll see a scene where he is um, talking and trying to convince them and mm. we find out why, you know, because the, the Tyrells are... Uh, well, at least in, in the books, I don't know what they're going to do here, but in the books, it's a child lord who's got mm. uh, his mother... Uh, Castellan and uh, was the master at arms at the High Garden. They were act- all three acting as mm. the regents for him, and uh, they, yeah, they decided to better to stay out of it. <laughs> um, Time wise, um, you know, we talked often on Game of Thrones about the, the jetpacks that became quite ubiquitous during the latter seasons for, for transporting people very quickly. It's quite clear that they have not brought over the jetpacks to House of the Dragon. Uh, Gwen says that he took three months marching from Old Town to King's Landing. Uh, that's uh, taking quite a bit of time. On the other hand, his later choice to look for an inn to stay in might explain that he wasn't exactly yeah. in a hurry. He mm. was taking the comfortable route. Uh, yeah, I think someone estimated that looking at the distances they quoted on the show in later seasons or sort of the way they frame things like they basically shrunk Westeros by 50%. And now three months is a long time for that trip, but it is a long trip. So I think they've they've just have put Westeros back to its normal size. Yeah. I mean, would you say that three months is inaccurate for three months is a very leisurely pace very for early. horse people on horseback. It's yeah. it's somebody who's stopping to have a drink driving every... slowly, stopping uh to, for lunch, <laughs> stopping, you know, at at oh, oh you know, we could go a few more hours, but there's this this inn, inn is much nicer. Yeah. Yeah. And taking his sweet time about it. I, I uh-huh. is his how I would read it. He, he seems a little feckless and so on. <laughs> um the Lyrian Serial Armor. Now this has been mentioned in um in certain contexts, which I won't go into because they're kind of spoilery, but uh, Aegon the Conqueror is never said to have had Valyrian seal armor. So mm-hmm. that that's a. Uh, I, I think. Had, but uh... could have, I feel like this is something that uh, probably Ryan, reading the same thing, said Valyrian seal armor. That is cool. I want it on the show. <laughs> okay, so, and then I want the uh, the the prop afterwards. Or... Well, as he said, he has to be careful about how much stuff he has gone with. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the helmet is something that he'll be interested in. in um... uh, yeah. Um, now, we talked a little bit about the scene with Ulf already, and uh, there's one oddity. Well, there's actually two oddities. Uh, a, he's in King's Landing instead of being a man at arms on Dragonstone. And it's never said, he never claims to have any specific uh, Targaryen blood. I mean, he, he's got the, uh, the white hair. That's white why hair. He's known as Ulf also the White. Yeah. So uh, he's, uh, he's a dragon seed. He's got. Uh, uh, some sort of Targaryen descent, hmm. but he never makes any claims to being uh, Balin's uh, bastard. Thing. Yeah, it's it's left just like he's just some he's just someone who has some Targaryen blood in the from the wrong side of the sheets in the past. And, in fact, uh, Balin is a bit of an oddity, isn't it? Yeah, because Balin Balin uh, he dies very young. Well, no, no? Balin is not. It's uh, he does not die very young. However, uh, he has an extremely successful marriage True. to Alyssa. Yes. Um, who was uh, <laughs> more than happy to uh, bend him, uh, her, her brother. Remember, they are siblings. Yes. Uh, and uh, was, was very, very, happy. Uh, very happy to have children. And she wanted to, uh, she's quoted as claiming she wanted to basically bear him an army. 
you know, basically. And, uh, yeah. So, so I say, Balin is not the no, but person. How, I mean, obviously, she dies in childbed, but having Damon. Yes. How long does he survive her by? Gosh, um, fifteen years. He doesn't. Okay, he never, it is like, never, he yeah. never remembers. He never no, remembers. No, but he never remembers. Uh, it's true. And and I, I mean, I suppose then again, Ulf. Yes, I guess Ulf like could be younger than. Uh, being, you know, having a hard life. I mean, I guess suppose if he wants to fit it over after, yeah, after too. losing Alyssa, he yeah. ended up, you know, occasionally dealing with his needs and, with, yeah. and, and sorrows of. But, but certainly, while he was married to her, I'd find. Yeah, it, it's, no, she kept him busy. He, I don't know, he seemed to have. Uh, she was the love of his life, so I, I, yeah. I mean, they were very determined to marry each other from quite a young age, as I. Recall, or was it just her being determined to marry him? Well, she they they were very close, and she was yeah yeah, yeah she she was uh, she was not going to let him get away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last but not least, a rather big change is the whole Rhaenyra is in King's Landing. Now, they'll not allow say this is secret history. The historians didn't record this because she kept it secret. They just thought, oh, she's still in mourning and she's not showing herself, and in no. fact, she's off carrying off the secret missions. I just I don't buy this. Uh, this this is not this is where the, I I know I know Ryan would say you can't prove it didn't happen I fine but the, these are completely different characters Alice and, and Rhaenyra the relationship is completely different uh, the role I I have to say the whole role of this prophecy is something they've invented for as a motivator it, it, you know it, it it's a change it's fine it, it it makes sense like if you really want to find the the, the secret history areas you can do it. Um, yeah, but it's like there's nothing that ever says, and she took off randomly to go here or there. No, I mean, a, uh, the whole thing about her being on store, uh, waiting to find you know the body of her son, Storm, yeah. and that's also another like surely that would have been recorded by somebody, and it's it's not because yeah. it, it didn't happen in the books. But this is the show's version of the Death of Dragons, and the show's version of Fire and Blood. Will will have to contain different details in some areas, or it cannot perfectly align. They can mostly align it, I'm not going to perfectly align it. And this is one of those areas. I, I it, it's fine. It's just yeah. like it's a, it's also like it's an enormous risk for her to take. But I, I just think like he's an, he's you know, Ryan's also a Star Trek fan. Like he like the the you know TNG and so and you know the, how often the captain decides to go on a dangerous away <laughs> mission uh, when he's not supposed to and constantly overriding you know Picard constantly overriding Riker. At least there weren't any red shirts being killed. There's plenty of red shirts being killed in these shows, but not not in this particular no, occasion. Not in this but particular but yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so I, I think he's like you know it's dramatic, it's interesting, it's important to have this conversation between them. So I. But it is a change. I, like I mean, for me, I guess I see it as a, a basically a wrapping up of the role that, to some extent, that they're expanding on the prophecy uh, because it has been sort of guiding her and she, yeah, she needs to know where Alison is on, on everything and, and now she knows that Viserys was clinging to that to the end. And uh, But yes, the, the expansion of the story and then the reconfiguration of the uh, Alison and, and Rhaenyra relationship by making them so close in age, uh, that drives most of the significant changes, I would say. Yeah. Because it drives a lot of the whole... It may have been done largely for them to be able to have this whole peace angle. Yeah. Yeah. For for there to be a debate about are we going to war or not? Yeah. Is there any way of avoiding war? Because uh, uh, the, the for, enmity... For, for book readers, it always feels like a foregone conclusion. There will be a war. Well, as soon, uh, as, soon as the Greens... Lay claim to the throne. Yes, there, there, there's no Rhaenyra is never going to back down and say ah, because no. this is one of the things that's never really discussed. Like, how do we make peace in an acceptable mm -hmm. way? Yes, there is that offer from uh, from Otto and Alicent. That does happen. They do try and offer her the uh, fatal complete that you know. Well, look, Aegon's got the throne. He's got the crown. Bend the knee, and you have Dragonstone, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, that happens, and that is rejected. 
There is no discussion at any point in the books that like, maybe we can manage to, to make a, a piece no. at this stage. It's It's gone too far. They don't like each other. But I think they wanted a way of playing it longer, playing it out yeah. over longer on the show. And then these two ways, having them be friends and having the prophecy, were ways of more credibly doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just glad. I think this was this is the last season where we have anyone talking about let's how do we make peace? How do we stop this from spinning out of control? Uh, I should think so. Yeah. <laughs> Background material. Um, well, one of the things that happens this episode is between episodes we have the Rain, Estermont, and Waters appointed to the King's Guard by Aegon. Um, appointment to the King's Guard is done differently from different kings, from one to another. From the evidence we have, um, most kings will select. The King's Guard themselves, uh, but some will maybe task someone else to kind of make the decision for them. Like who, you know, you have more experience in this. Who, who would make a better? So, for example, in the White Book, uh, the entry for Sebastian Selmy says that he was personally selected to King's Guard by Sir the Lord Commander Sir Gerald Hightower, mm. the White Bull. So, at that point, it was the the king was um, King Jaehaerys II, and he clearly trusted. He was not a, a fighting man. Uh, in fact, there seems to be there are suggestions that he had a a withered arm, um, and it could be that he basically decided, you know, you we need a new king's guard. Who do you think he might have had some say, like yes, no, or maybe was presented some uh, options? But regardless, Sir Gerald is the one who is credited. Mm-hmm. So here it sounds like Aegon has just decided, hey, my buddy should be my king's guard. <laughs> And these guys... I like hanging out with them. I like hanging out with them. And these guys figured, oh, great, we're going to have the honor of being Kingsguard and we're going to be able to screw around and drink and do... And, and then not realizing that Aegon was... Uh, no, not... I mean, the drinking, yes. The, the screwing around, no. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to make of his expression, but yes, I think you're right that he was actually... He kind of enjoyed putting, like, having that power and all of a sudden... Kind yeah. Of, it was a, a very petty way to be, oh, yeah, I'm the king. Um, yeah, he's a bit of a petty fellow, isn't he? And we have an Orin connection. Uh, yes, uh, Jane Orin, the Lady Orin at this time, is called cousin uh, to Emma Orin, uh, the mother of Rhaenyra in the, in the first season, but she's now called Rhaenyra's cousin. Uh, so we don't actually know Jane's precise relation to Roderick Orin, but in all likelihood she's the eldest surviving grandchild from his first wife, while Emma was his daughter by his second wife, uh, Princess Della Targaryen, who would have been a great aunt to Viserys and Daemon. And, and then, their offspring. And their yeah. offspring, yes. So Jane would have been like a half-niece of Emma, and Rhaenyra and her would have been half-first cousins. Yeah, one of those very... <laughs> but they'll call one another cousin. That yeah, is cousin because, is a nice short uh, Westeros does use it fairly broadly, but they don't tend to use uh, these fine distinctions of first, second, third, and so on. First one's removed and second, yeah. So, no, she, she's a cousin and uh, that, that'll do. Um, um, and then uh, an interesting one. We have the term dragon seed used for, I think it's the first time it's used here. It's Ulf who calls himself, uh, he's a dragon seed and they need to watch their back about their own backs because, you know, there are, you know, they don't have a white cloak person guarding them. Yeah. Um, the term is applied to bastards of, I would say, I mean, uh, Valyrian, especially Targaryen descent, yeah. who kind of are said to exist in surprisingly, or not, large numbers <laughs> on Dragonstone because of the habit of the men of House Targaryen mm-hmm. and back in the days to, well, take advantage of the right of the first night. Yeah. This is the uh, Jus Prima Nocte, which is... Uh, didn't which exist. Has, yeah, which historians have said is, is, is a myth. Um, but also, George reveals not only did they do this, but for the most part, the people of Dragonstone, kind of, they half worship the Targaryens, these beautiful mm-hmm. dragon riders, mm-hmm. and they saw it as a blessing. So that especially if their the belly swelled and out came a you know, silver-haired, purple-eyed mm-hmm. child. There were usually gifts involved and... Uh, Silks and gold and, 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 you know, they would be called, you know, born of dragon z- seed and would be quite, seed as quite valued. Yeah. So um, there, there are, we're to take it, there's a lot of undocumented, really, uh, bastards and descendants of these bastards throughout um, Dragonstone and, I guess, Driftmark. Um some may have then made their way to the coastal areas and so on. So, um. 
so we'll finish off with some uh, dragon facts. We, we don't get that much new, but we have uh, Daeron's dragon is mentioned as nearing fighting age, and this would then be Tessarion, who will be known as the Blue Queen. She has uh, dark cobalt uh, scales with copper belly scales and claws and crest, and even supposed to breathe a cobalt blue flame. I wish they, they did more of that in the show. I wish they actually embraced that part of it. I guess they feel it's a little late because they didn't do it with uh, the, the, mm. the original three dragons on Game of Thrones. But yes, George's idea is that these dragons, their, their fire itself is magical. So like Valyrian the Black Dread had black flames mm. of like uh, so dark, you know, like black and then like a dark red outline. Yeah. So he, for example, Mark Simonetti did a fantastic job in his Presumably uh, calendar Presumably Maraxxus would have had silver flames and, and Vaga. Yeah, there's different, green, often often related to their, their, color, their, yeah. their color. So um, um, uh, George uh, had uh, has listed a few and we, in, in the Rise of a Dragon in particular, we made sure to... Um, by that point, we had George's list of the dragon's colors, and sometimes he specified what color the flames were. So we there we tried to really push the artist to like, oh, depict the right colors, flames as well as the right colors for a dragon. So uh, that's one reason to get that book if you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> uh, and that will leave us uh, complete until um, next week when we come back for the uh, fourth episode, <laughs> which uh, everything suggests is going to be a very uh, eventful, eventful. That's what you're hitting the mid season. Yeah. So until then, things will start happening. Until then.